got a bit of a podcast for you here. Um, so let me start like this. Let me explain from my perspective, creatively, choreographically, what the art of ballet really is about fundamentally. Now, what's the underpinning? Now, this is not just my opinion. This comes from Novair also, so this is long before my time, obviously, but I've thought, been thinking this through for some years, and this is kind of what I think. So we've all, we, we all have one thing in common, for sure, all, all human beings, and that is that we reach a level of emotional intensity to which words cannot, ex we cannot express those feelings adequately through words. Words are just too clumsy, right? And it's not an unusual thing. So any time a person, particularly, let's say, over 12, you know, 11, 12 and up, when you cry, you begin to cry, that is the point to which words are inadequate, right? So whether it's uh, for positive reasons or for tragic reasons, normally what happens is you cry and you work out the, the most intense level of emotion and then you can talk about things after that, right? Well, the, 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 the genius, the beauty, the magic that is possible to create in ballet because we're, we're not expressing ourselves through the la our language, our words, right? That we, we use the language of classical dance, and in that language we can express these feelings through movement, through uh, not just movement, but obviously our whole bodies, right? That is the point of this art, truly. So why don't we see that, or we rarely see it? We've rarely seen it. Even if you look at the whole 20th century, there's, there certainly have been performances where that has been evident. I've not seen it that much in my life, maybe a couple of times, just a handful of times, in Russia mostly. But because describing it that way, I think, can give the impression that it's a natural thing to do, and it is not. So the sophistication required to express those kinds of, that level of emotion, to, first of all, to conjure it up, to design the steps to the music in such a way that the artist, the ballerina, has the room in the ballet to create those feelings or to conjure them up from their life and then express them. and, and it, it, requires incredible level of know-how, just competency, right? And, and understanding technically how to craft a dancer, for one, from the beginning, right? Coach them up, which is just the continuation of training anyway. And then, so to take all the knowledge, for example, that I have as a, as a teacher, as a coach, as a pedagogue, that knowledge has but really one purpose, and that is to be able to create ballets all the aspects of it, right? So to, to coach the dancers, to select the music, to imagine the steps, to craft them in real life, to create the story, to phrase everything, to, to, to use the fundamental components of this language of classical dance, to craft all of this, coordinate it all, put it together, and leave room for the artists to have the freedom to, you know, play with their emotions and find out how they want to connect to the characters and to the story and how the music impacts them. And this can be different on any given night. And in fact, it, it would be good for that to happen, right? So you just don't feel the same every day, obviously. You're not in front of the same audience every day. You may not even be dancing with all the same dancers all the time, right? The orchestra could sound slightly different, different musicians, different conductor, you know, tempos can be... This is what ballet must be, as much as it is possible. The issue that I keep trying to articulate uh, is the fact that to even begin to think about doing that, there has to be a great level of skill and knowledge and education preceding it. So, um, 
and this is why this is what frustrates me uh, quite a lot, uh, just in general about the ballet world, is that there's just there seems to be just a lack of perspective in this way that it it, it seems so much easier than it is to even create a a simple ballet competently, to even create, to craft a duet, like a pas de deux, right? It's just, there are so many things to consider and elements to be aware of if you want to affect, emotionally affect an audience, which is the point of performing arts. That is the point. It's to make them feel something, to hopefully resonate with them, relate in some way or another. But to make people feel, that's what we're in the business of. Making people feel, and people want to pay for that. If it's genuine, the feelings that are coming at them. And then the idea then is that it becomes a collaboration, in a, in a sense, an emotional collaboration with the audience. So the performers are giving just everything they've got to give, and that's going to bounce off the audience, and you're going to get something back. And then what you get is this this really wonderful interaction with an audience. And that's what we all want to do. That, that, that's why I'm here talking to you right now. It's to get to that point. And if I'm being honest, I think, you know, there's, there's always this talk of, I always get the same criticism, it's like I'm arrogant or something. It's, <laughs> it isn't that at all. What it is, is uh, let me tell you what I think I've accomplished just as a little bit of a digression here. All that I have accomplished really is the ability to now accomplish something. And that's it, that's how I honestly view myself. Now, I don't, I don't find that to be arrogant at all, but you know, if that's arrogant, then so be it, I guess I am. But that's where I'm coming from at the moment, to say, okay, now I can accomplish, I, th I can accomplish something. I can accomplish something like what I'm describing to you, obviously with the collaboration of other uh, folks who share my perspective or wish to share it, that kind of a thing. Okay, I said all that to say this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, at least give you kind of a sketch of how this might work in real life right now in America. Let's just stick with America for a minute. So on, on one hand, I can go to Russia and make anything I want at this point. This is just what it is. You know, I know them, they know me. Uh, I understand how to work with them. It, it, Russia just, it, to me, Russia is a, is a, something that I understand culturally. Of course, Svetlana is, 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 is the reason why all that works, primarily, right? It, and it, Russia, Russian ballet is a known quantity to me. I understand what to expect. I, I know how to work within that system. Again, with Svetlana. American ballet is just something that I'm not... I know what is going on. I understand the perspective because I'm, I began dance the, the same way everybody else does here. But I have not spent... I mean, the last 20 years, I, I, I have not been in American ballet very much. Just little bits of stuff here and there. In fact, I think, if my memory serves, the only professional dancer I've ever worked with in American ballet is Misty. Right? So that, that's it, you know, in terms of my connection to American ballet, the profession. So, but, but to the topic at hand is this. Here's how I think this can happen. And I'm going to use Julie Kent as an example. And I'll tell you, I, I've met her a couple times briefly. I, I, I don't know her, and I met her husband as well, and her, her children. So let me use Julie Kent as an example of why I think her, the company she's directing, so Washington Ballet, under her direction, I think is the company best positioned to accomplish what I just described. Right? Which is to have a, let's say, just to use simple language, the ballet world desperately needs a hit. Hit ballet, like a hit record, right? More than one. I mean, we need a hit really badly, not just in America, but in the, in the world. Um, but in America is what I'm talking about and where I'm concerned most about it. We need hit ballets. And, you know, I'm going to get accused of this again, but in, I'm, I'm well positioned to great these things, you understand? But again, it has to be a collaboration. 
And this is what I'm trying to wrap my mind around. Is it possible for me to get this done here? And not necessarily here in New York, but here in, in America. Or am I just going to go to Europe and, and that's the way it's going to be done? I would like to do work everywhere, frankly, but you know, America seems to be the puzzle that I'm trying to sort out. So, you know, here we go. So why Washington Ballet? Okay, well, one, the size of the company is, it's the right size company, and I, I don't have all the, the figures, but I think they have something like 30, 40 dancers, something like that. Um, Julie Kent is the right person to lead a ballet company, in my opinion. Um, and the fact that it's in the capital. So these elements, to me, mean that this company can innovate very efficiently, like maybe a season or two, maybe just a season, right? It depends on a number of factors, but... And I'm going to go further with this, and this is really the point I wanted, I wanted to get to. Uh, I think Julie Kinn should be dancing, frankly. I think the new... Let's, let's say there were to be a new ballet made. I think it should be set on, on uh, I'm using her as an example, but her, right? She should be dancing. Now, I'm not telling Julie Kent what to do. I'm just saying if, if, how do I say this? Okay, let me back up a little bit. Let me tell you what I, how I responded to Misty's first email to me. I'm just, just a little piece of it. What I, how I responded, she wrote and expressed herself, and what I responded is like, look, you, I, I told her that you are in the prime of your artistic life. So I'm just going to stay with women right now because it's the theme I want to talk about, but the same for men. A woman in her, let's say, mid-30s and up is the mo really the most interesting kind of person you're going to interact with, not, not just in ballet, but in life. There, there's, there's something about that age and up where, and, and I can tell you from personally what it is, you tend to take on real life changing responsibility in your 30s, right? You get married or have a committed relationship and then children, and these are massive life changing steps that I found put people in touch with themselves. Right? You, you, how else do you understand yourself without taking responsibility on that's really, frankly, too much for you to handle in the moment that it begins? And you just have to figure this out. Like the moment, I'm just saying, the moment that you become a parent, that moment, right? Because I was in the room, Misha comes out. I mean, you go from zero to your whole life just changed in front of you. And I'm just speaking from the dad side of it, but for a mother, I, I, I mean, it's intense in a way that, I mean, and, and it's not just a momentary, it's, it's still that way. You know, Misha's 11 years old. It's, when you recognize, when you just recognize the responsibility there, it's, it's phenomenal. And so I think one of the reactions that just occurs in your mind is that, you know, it not, does, of course it grows you up, but it also, you learn a lot about yourself when you're under pressure, you know. So I said all that to say this, so, for example, Julie Kent has children and family and the whole thing. So that kind of, the, the feelings I was speaking about a little bit ago, to where there are not words, I mean, look, being a parent, the kind of love that you have for your, your child, the kind of frustration that you can have with your child, uh, just the full spectrum of feelings are, are pretty well beyond words, right? Often, you know, even, even funny things like, like Misha, he, like I said, he, he just turned 11 at the end of August and we spent a lot of time together, and uh, just the other day I'm, I said, well, I said, Mish, you want to go to Chipotle and get a burrito? I was like, yeah, I think that would satiate my hunger. Satiate? I don't, I haven't, I've not said the word satiate probably ever. My 11-year-old is, you see what I mean? And there's, there's times when I, um, 
I try to give him thought experiments to work out, like philosophical dilemmas, kind of. And um, what is it that he said to me? He used a really good word. He, uh, shit, what was it? Oh, yeah. So he says, I, I gave him one of these. and says, Dad, that's, that's quite a conundrum. Conundrum? Where is he getting this vocabulary from? You know what I mean? Like, so just some of these things that you experience being a parent goes just beyond the normal range of, of feelings is my point. And so all of that is what we need to create ballets about and from and for. And so uh, my overall point in mentioning Misty and mentioning Julie Kent is this. Ballerinas and the men, but let's stay with women. Ballerinas re are retired or retire, I think, in the prime of their life as a human being, you know, or are retired, which is worse, you know. So, I mean, look, if if Julie Kent didn't want to, doesn't want to dance, that's obviously, you know, the decision of, of every dancer. Do what you must do with your life. I'm, but to be retired when there's still, there's just so much, I think, in, in the tank that can be shared and explored and, and, and created, that is, to me, it's just a, a bit of a tragedy. And this is the history of ballet, by the way. Now, we, now, obviously, you have some ballerinas like Maya Plasetskaya danced into her 60s. So you have examples of women that have kind of transcended the, the normal nonsense. And, you know, it was brilliant. Brilliant, right? And I, I don't know, I have half a mind to, to just form, to maybe create a couple of ballets like this, just to encourage some of these ballerinas of this generation, say, come out of retirement, let's get you squared away, placed and strong and the whole thing, and let's create some really brilliant stuff. You know, I mean, these, these are thoughts I'm having anyway. Now, but here's the thing. If you look at what is at the center of most ballet companies in the world, the repertoire, right? These are ballets whose origin, that they, they're not created, well, they're almost all created by men. I mean, they're all created by men, right? So I'm talking about the classics, Balanchine, all this I kind of put in the same category. They're created by men and the pers so with that, I mean, really, I think without any genuine collaboration with the women who premiered the roles, right? I think it's just mostly just giving orders kind of a thing. And so not only were they created in another time, right, especially the classics. I mean, these are 100, 150 years old. It's just a completely different time. And obviously, I mean, the women didn't have the right to vote when these ballets were created, you know? I mean, it was just, just absurd, you know, that we would carry these things over to the present. These men surely didn't really understand women at all. I mean, they just had this very, I think, narrow view of what a woman is, was. Um, and I don't exempt myself, I'm not saying I understand women in a, in a great sense. I mean, I think it took me probably a decade just to understand my wife to, an, to an, a good extent, right? Um, you know, the, the, so what I'm saying is the repertoire just doesn't exist, I think, y even yet, to where a ballerina in her 30s, 40s, 50s, what, what have you, where, there, where there's even a role for them to where they can flesh out really any degree of real feeling, genuine feeling, to where they could honestly express themselves with these very narrow, limited characters that in any case, I think were created for, you know, 20 year olds, 25, you know. You, I mean, all I can say is my 20 year old self was a moron just on all, like, there's, there's really very little relation to my 20-year-old self, 20s, and who I am now, you know, post-marriage and kid, and that kind of thing. 
So I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but anyway, just this is kind of just what I'm thinking about. So to get, to create ballets that people, that audiences will love to see, will pay to see, therefore we can have hits, therefore there's, I mean, there's always the practical side to this, which is money, right? This is, this is, the, this is what ballet suffers from, is a lack of product, a lack of money. And so the, the, the community has been forced to do all kinds of um, unfortunate things to keep afloat, which really what has to happen is we just need to make ballets that people want to see. And I've just given you some points as to how to go about doing that. And I think, you know, step one is to, for those ballerinas and male dancers who wish to continue dancing into their 40s and 50s, uh, Vladimir Vasiliev did this, Maximova did this, you know, so there, there, there is history here where you can watch them dance brilliantly. And there's a very specific way to go about dealing with the physical stuff. I understand that that's a concern for sure. But placement is the solution to that. I've already demonstrated that with Misty to where you actually get stronger. You know, whatever injuries are there or were there, these things can be sorted out. Um, and look, the, the difference between a dancer who's 20, 25 and, you know, 55 or whatever, 45, 35, is you just don't need the repetition the physical repetition. So for a ballerina like Julie Kent, she has a, a whole lifetime of experience. She doesn't need to do class, like dancing around in a, in a normal class. It's just a very, very, uh, very precise type of training. You, most of you know what I'm talking about with placement. And then you just get to work on the choreography. And you just take placement and you apply it there and you, there's no need for all of the running about, you see. So this is, so, as you age in ballet, the, the, the pedagogical understanding is that you preserve yourself, right? In other words, you don't dance, you know, three, four times a week or even once a week. You know, you, you preserve yourself, take care of yourself, you know? So, yeah, I, I think that of, of all the companies in, in America that I am aware of, I think Washington Ballet is the one best position to, I think, even lead American Ballet, if I'm being honest. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of variables there to consider. But just as a, as a general statement of fact, this is a company that I think is worth paying a lot of attention to. And, you know, I think there's a ton of potential there. And... I would like to see Julie Kent dance, to be honest with you, and just but but have a, a role created on her, and then you know, and this is one of the things the Soviets did right. So, you, although again with the very limited range of roles, but what could be done here, for example, so we set ballets on these generations of ballerinas. So they dance as long as they feel like they want to dance and can do it well. But then there's always the next generation that can come up and be mentored by these dancers. But, so there are roles that originated on them. So we have current generations now. We're, we're not trying to set a ballet that's 150 years old on, on really a totally different culture in the world that just doesn't match up at all. You know, we're just, so, so just like the classics were old a hundred years ago, and this is not my opinion alone, this is the opinion of uh, the Russian ballet scholars a hundred years ago. They, like for Fokin, obviously, there was this whole movement of Fokin wanted to move things forward, Vaganova, and so there's a Pitipa, Vaganova were kind of one political unit, and then Fokin and, and others were another political unit. They wanted to move ballet forward, they wanted to preserve, Vaganova, uh, Pitipa wanted to preserve, I mean, Vaganova and others wanted to preserve the Pitipa ballets, is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, obviously they won out, and now we're all still doing these, these very narrow ballets. And that's just my opinion. People will disagree, that's okay. But, you know, we're not still riding horses you know, uh, we're not still burning coal, at least in the Western world. Uh, I mean, in our homes, uh, you know, 
culture has moved forward, the world has moved forward, and we need to move forward with it. This is my point. 